You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark. To the Hazard Ground Podcast, as always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. And for those of us joining us on our YouTube channel, as well as KillCliff.com and the KillCliff app, we appreciate you guys taking part in the new video venture of the Hazard Ground Podcast. Uh, before we get to this week's episode, a story of the shortest man to ever serve in the military. Just a couple of quick notes. I want to remind you guys about our Apple reviews. Keep, please keep them coming. We want to get to over a thousand. Again, this helps grow the podcast and gets more notoriety. So we certainly appreciate everybody who has done so, so far. Please remind you guys to finish follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground and Hazard Ground Podcast. And don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab as well. You can do the same thing on your smartphone and it'll redirect you right to the app. So all of your information about your credit card is saved. Uh, you spend whatever you want. You shop however you want. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend and then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. We appreciate you guys being part of this Hazard Ground community. A uh, story this week actually is being told by an individual who is not the story that it is about. It is about a man named Richard J. Flaherty, who was living on the streets in Miami and befriended a Miami police officer. And eventually, the officer found out who this individual was. Richard Flaherty was the smallest and most unconventional man to serve in the U.S. military. He was a Green Beret who was awarded a Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, and two Purple Hearts for his acts in Vietnam. And then his story was told by our guest in a book called The Giant Killer that has also become a movie. He is David Yuzik joining us on the Hazard Ground podcast. David, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Well, again, it's always interesting to hear the third person point of view. Now, usually when we tell these stories, um, you know, from somebody else giving the perspective, uh, it, unfortunately, it's a gold star individual, right? a, a family member or a spouse that that has to tell it. That's not the case for you. I mean, this is somebody, a random stranger that you had met on the streets of Miami and you be uh, as a Miami police officer is how you came into contact uh, with Richard Flaherty to learn about his story. So, before we get to how you met him, just a little bit of background about yourself for our audience. Well, originally from Brooklyn, New York, moved to Miami and became a police officer. Uh, worked for 20 years and just recently retired with a, a back injury. Um, met Richard Flaherty probably uh, just when I transferred, because I transferred from a small police department over to the city of Aventura, which is in Miami. Miami broke up into a bunch of little jurisdictions. Everybody wanted their own police department uh, to take care of their, their personal needs. So I worked for a city of about 120 police officers, full service, detective bureau, SWAT team. And uh, that's when I met Richard. What were you doing when you met Richard? Actually, uh, I was working in an off-duty job. You know, you get hired by uh, different people to work roadside construction. I was doing an off-duty job at the movie theater they were having some problems, some fights there. So I was in uniform and uh, I, I would see Richard come into the movies and he'd spend the whole day there. Uh, but, you know, he's, you know, initially stuck out just because he was so small, um, four foot nine, 97 pounds, but um, athletic, walked very ramrod straight. Uh, he had something about his presence that you knew he was a, a different type of individual. I would just see him and we slowly started acknowledging each other, little, those little head nods, you know, you see somebody over and over and then head nod went to, uh, how did you like the movie? And we just started talking that way. So what was one of your first or most memorable interactions with them as you guys started to, you know, befriend each other? Well, uh, I would start running into him uh, in the city. I would see him just walking around, sitting on benches. Initially, you, know, you had the impression something was off when you'd see him all day at that movie theater or all day at the mall, just walking around, sitting on benches, but not until you, you know, you saw him outdoors sitting on benches that you realized this guy's probably homeless. Uh, just quick thing for your audience. He, 
he, he really kept up his appearance. So, you know, when I say homeless, he did live outdoors, but he was uh, very well kept. So, um, you know, the, the thing is when you first, you know, as a police officer encounter somebody like that, you want to try to get him some help, try to get him off the streets, get him in some type of program, but he was a very proud man. So, uh, you know, I asked him only maybe twice, you know, is there something we can do for you? And he, he said, no, I'm good. So we have a certain criteria that legally, you know, somebody would have to meet for me to take them against their will and put them in a shelter. And he didn't meet that. He, he was taking care of himself, uh, well-fed and seemed to be mentally healthy. So um, my first impressions was this guy knows uh, a lot about the world and world politics. And he, he was a really intelligent guy. And I enjoyed, we would just, you know, since I didn't, I uh, asked him about his background and who he was, or where he came from. Uh, we would just talk about world politics, and I really enjoyed his opinion. Did you get a sense that he was a veteran, or did he just seem like somebody who was smart, somebody who had been educated, or did you get a sense that he, you know, was a guy who had had fought in combat? No, 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 no indication of that whatsoever. On top of like. You know, me and Richard, we started meeting for lunch and coffee, and, and I've never heard of anyone saying that, you know, in that time when he was in the city, which I knew him for like 15 years, him ever mentioning he was in the military or trying to get some sort of break or, or, or something. So, no, I, I had no indication. I just thought he's a really uh, well-read uh, guy and very intelligent and very interesting man to talk to and, um, you know, never judge a book by its cover, so... That's, that was did, my impressions. Did, did you ever feel or ever try to help him and get him off the street? I mean, you feel like after you develop a friendship with somebody and you know him, there's a certain sense of, or do you ever, you know, just bluntly approach him and say, hey, you know, Richard, are you homeless? Do you, do you, do you have a place to live? Does that have conversation ever happen? It, it did. And early on, you know, when, when I was trying to get him off the streets, um, but he, you know, he was just, uh, he just would answer it. I'm okay. And, and uh, no, I don't need any assistance. And, you know, my, my ability, I hope I have a good ability to read people and my ability to read him was uh, just let him be. Um, you know, if I saw him in some sort of really bad condition, yeah, I would, I would take some sort of police action to protect him from himself. But he, he seemed like, uh, even though he was on the streets, he, he was taking care of himself. And, and this is free country. And, you know, as long as he's not a, a danger to himself or others, uh, he, he can choose to live his life the way he, he wanted to. Did you ever ask him as a homeless guy, how, how, where are you getting the money to go to the movies? How are you keeping up with your appearance? I mean, it, some of it just, you know, on the surface doesn't seem to add up. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just the, uh, the, the old New York Brooklyn guy thing where we don't get into, uh, you know, if somebody yeah. doesn't volunteer it. We, we don't, Really, and I think that's, I really believe that's why out of all the people he talked to me probably the most is because I didn't press him. I, I kind of read uh, the message he was given to me that, you know, he, he was looking to talk to somebody in friendship, but he certainly didn't like people peering into his life. So I, I hope I read it right. And, and you know, we were friends for about 15 years before he dropped that big bomb on me. Okay, 15 years, and uh, how does that little conversation come about where he says to you, I kind of got to tell you who I am? That's exactly, we, we were uh, having uh, lunch at a sandwich shop, a Subway sandwich shop, and he just, he just looked at me and said, Dave, it's time I tell you who I really am. So uh, it sounds like something from a movie, but as a police officer, you're super nervous. Here's I mean, a guy I enjoy talking go, to. I'm really Andre the Giant. Yeah, I'm just messing with you. Watch this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so, so you know, as a police officer, you're kind of scared. Like, is he going to say he's a serial killer? Is he said he's wanted by the FBI? Like, what, what are the next words that are going to come out of his mouth? And how is it going to impact uh, my life and his, you know, our friendship? So, you know, he just blurted out, I was the smallest man ever served in the military. And I went to Vietnam and won these... Uh, uh, medals and you know i i of course i, I just immediately disbelieved them I, I i just thought it's pretty sad i thought he was pretty sharp mentally and this is some sort of delusion like and no one ever heard i've never heard of a, a four foot nine guy being in the military and how could he possibly you know even make it through basics so um kind of dismissed it kind of felt bad i humored him uh sometimes we do that 
people with you know delusions and mental as long as their delusions are not harming anybody you just let it go so you know I, I didn't really press him too much we talked I don't know maybe 10 minutes the most about it uh he told me he did some undercover operations and you know it just it got very Tom Clancy like so um went home that night and almost didn't check on Google to see if any part of his story is true, but something told me just took a quick look and lo and behold, all these old newspaper articles from like 1967 started popping up of smallest man joins the military, smallest man becomes an officer, uh, small man wants a green beret type things. And I was in shock. I mean, I was in shock because this treasure, this incredible human being that a million people every day pass on a bus bench might be one of the most interesting people, you know, to, to ever speak to, you know, if you think back in history. So uh, I, I was I was blown away. And uh, when I went to go see him the next day, because he lived under a tree. So there was this one tree that he mostly stayed under. Uh, he saw a smile on my face and he said, yeah, you didn't believe me, did you? You know, you checked out. He knew, you know, he, he was really sharp. Man, so did anybody else know about your relationship with him? Any family members, other officers, and anybody in the police force? Or is this sort of something you sort of just kept to yourself? No, the, the, the other officers would see me sitting there talking to him, you know, all, all the time. It's not something I brought up in roll call or something that, you know, um, but, uh, you know, other people knew that, that, uh, that me and him had a friendship. Uh, I believe there was a few other officers that talked to him. And actually, the uh, fire rescue people that were just about a block away from his tree where he lived. I, I later found out, you know, when I was investigating his life, uh, that they took care of him too. It was pretty remarkable. A bunch of firemen, they let him into the firehouse every once in a while, take a shower. They let him crash on their couch out, outside to, to get some sleep. So they were very compassionate and uh, I'm really glad to hear I wasn't the only one that, that, you know, went out of their way to make Richard a little more comfortable. All right. So you go through the first step of Google and figure out a little bit more about this. It is, is the next step like, you know, let me run them through FBI and Interpol and everything else and every other police system there is to find out what else this guy is about? Well, the next step, I mean, as a former detective was that undercover operation. He said he worked with the ATF uh, in the 80s and he was pretty adamant that first time we talked, he said, just, you know, you can ask me questions about my life, but don't look into that case. And I was like, well, why shouldn't I look into that case? Well, so you, well, he says that now you have to go look into of it. Of course. So, so he <laughs> says, well, it'd be, it'd be bad for your career and probably dangerous for my health. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, here's another one. Like, okay. Oh, yeah, he sure. set you up for this. Right. Where, where are we going from here? So it took me, I think it took me a week to track down the alleged undercover federal agent that he worked with. And I had contacts and I tracked the guy down and he was retired and um, I gave him a cold call. I got his phone number through another contact and I gave him a cold call. And that was on Friday, May, May 8th, uh, 2015. I, I called agent Fred Gleffy. And uh, once again, you know, yep. Everything Richard told you is the truth. Yep. We did this undercover operation and um, it's all true. And once again, I was blown away, but uh not any more blown away than uh, I find out the next morning after the phone call that uh, guys are, you know, guys I work with, the other police officers, early in the morning, I don't know, 5 or 6 a.m., they were knocking on my door saying, hey, uh, sorry to tell you, your friend was just killed in a hit and run. So, uh, you know, six hours after I made that call, Richard was dead. Wow. Um, okay, well, one, let me back up. Um, are you allowed to tell us what the undercover ATF operation is? Is it all unclassified, declassified at this point? Yeah, there was uh, there was something. You know, I, I actually uh, the the sequence was I did make the documentary first, and after the documentary, so many people reached out with new information, and there was information that I knew but I couldn't confirm that I didn't put in the documentary because I wanted that thing to be as exact as possible and no, you know, even reaching. So um, the, the undercover case initially was uh, a couple of Green Berets out of Fort Bragg were stealing tons of weapons and explosives and selling it on the black market. And Richard got wind of it and he brought in the ATF and they worked undercover. Um, the ATF agent Fred Gleffy, he posed as a Miami drug dealer looking to purchase explosives and weapons for the 
Colombian cartels. So, um, but th that's not what Richard told me what the real mission was. He said that was sort of like part of the mission. The real mission, which I just rele uh, released in the book was uh, that they had to recover a, um, a SATAM, which was a, a atomic demol demolition munition, which was a, a miniature nuclear device, a, a miniature nuclear bomb called the SATAM. And that was declassified, I think maybe 10 years ago. Um, the army created it in, I think the late fifties with the idea that a special forces uh, two man team would infiltrate into an area and plant this thing. And it had about the power to take out the Hoover Dam or a block of New York city on top of the radiation. Wow. So one of those, one of those atoms went missing from Vietnam. Um, most of my sources all said that it was inert, that it was used for training, but it still had about a, a about a million dollar price tag on the black market, even back in the eighties, if it got, you know, into the wrong hands, somebody can kind of figure out how to recreate it. Only one person told me that it was a live Saddam. So um, I didn't put that in the documentary because I just didn't have enough uh, uh, corroboration. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably about the, the biggest classified thing from that case. Um, the other thing that was a little shocking was after the case, the undercover case was uh, a bunch of newspaper reporters, uh, which those uh, stories just got declassified a couple of years ago, wrote a lot about that the whole mission was a CIA operation um, by Richard Flaherty to help get weapons down to Central America and to Honduras and uh, fight communism there in the 80s, sort of like the um, Iran-Contra scandal. So a lot of layers to the story. Uh, I solved some and every time I solved one mystery, two more would pop up. And I think that's the whole essence of Richard Flaherty. They, they say it's a a puzzle uh, wrapped in a, a, a riddle and an enigma. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's the essence of Richard Flaherty. And he was very uh, compartmentalized that he never told this, you know, everyone the whole story. He would only tell, you know, even his closest friends, family members, uh, little pieces of his life. So no one really ever can figure out everything. Uh, he's just, you know, besides being the smallest guy to serve in the military, uh, just really mysterious guy as you start going down these rabbit holes um is there a part of you as as the cop that takes over that says i i have to find the end of this thing i mean are, are you almost caught up in what you're looking at you know the 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 rabbit holes don't stop and i'm glad you point, you brought that up because i kind of thought once i finished the documentary i, I did you know because I did ask Richard if I could do a story on his life after he, I didn't know how I was going to do a story. I just said, I just thought at the time before he was killed, this is the most incredible story of the most incredible underdog that did the impossible, became a green beret. How did you become homeless? Like, and how do we prevent other right. soldiers returning from becoming homeless or PTSD? So that was the initial idea of exploring it before he gets killed. Um, and I just kind of, and one thing he made me promise was that if we start the project, no matter what happens, you have to finish it. So I, I felt this tremendous burden to not leave this man's life on the side of the road, the way he was left in the hit and run uh, to die on the side of the road. So I, I just felt a tremendous, tremendous burden to uh, complete the story and do the documentary. But then it, it never ended. Like I thought I was done and move on with the next chapter of my life. And then all these people are contacting me that, oh, I went to uh, Africa, South Africa with Richard. We worked, you know, as mercenaries, we fought in the Rhodesian. I'm like, oh my God, it just, it, it's never going to end. He, he's, you know, this is, this is a never ending story. So um, it, it I met this journey, you know, you, you think about like, I, I've heard some people say, you know, oh my God, Richard was lucky that he had you as a friend. I, I can't even, I think it's completely the opposite. I think I, I am beyond lucky that this man talked to me, that I had the time I did have with him and the journey it, it, it brought me on because, you know, looking into his life, I, I had to go to reunions and meet up with other guys from the 101st Airborne that he served with in Vietnam. And I made some long lasting friendships with these guys. I mean, they're really, they took me under their wing and I, I wasn't, I'm not a military guy, I was a cop, but that doesn't, you know, I don't speak the same language, but uh, amazing journey. 
I, I oh got so many questions. Um, so for a, a cop and a detective, I mean, are, are you, when you start undertaking this project, you're not still on the force, are you? Yeah. When, when it initially started, I, I was still, I was still well, working. How do you, you juggle all that? Well, it, it was tough, but I got the, I got permission from my chief and he, my, my chief was actually a Vietnam vet. And, you know, once he said, Hey, did you vet him really good? Did you, is this guy really, you know, everybody was blown away. Is this guy really what, what he says? Once I proved that he said, yeah, go ahead. I mean, you know, police work, I think we're seeing now is not just about um, taking bad guys to jail. And all. it's also about reaching out, meeting the community, being compassionate. So I think, I think it was important. And um, yeah, I burned the candle at both ends. You know, I worked, you know, an eight, uh, 10 hour shift, and then I would start writing and, and getting prepared. You know, initially the idea was, like I said, I didn't know how I was going to tell the story, but I, I didn't want to do it. I was hoping some real filmmaker or somebody with real book writing experience, they were going to take it over. It wasn't, how, how am I going to do it? I'm just. Uh, that was my next question. You've never wrote a book before, obviously. Do you even know how to start this whole process? I mean, do you even know how to start putting chapter one together? No, I mean, the, I'll tell you what, though. Uh, the, the, the years of working as a detective, actually, you know, as a police officer, too, actually really helped because what are you doing in a narrative? You know, your offense incident narrative or your, your detective report, you're, you're, you're telling the story, you know, and some, some of my uh, detective reports were 20, 50 pages, and you're just walking people through the story. So I think I had the experience from the police work to uh to do the writing uh as far as the documentary i just winged it yeah well we'll, we'll get to that um uh, if you're going to write the story of someone's life um who unfortunately is no longer living how do you fill in all the holes like i mean you don't i mean and again it's it's one of those things where yes there's the internet out there but so at the end of the day, there, there's some first person stuff. I mean, was a lot of it you relying on your memory about stories that you guys had talked about and things that you had discussed over the years? Or, uh, I mean, how do you even go about giving people context for who Richard Flaherty was? Yeah, well, after, you know, after he told me who he was and then I asked him, hey, can I do a story about your life? That's when we went into those really long in depth conversations and we were meeting every day and I was taking notes and I was questioning him and you know, hey, walk me through the story and where did you go from here and what were your thoughts and tell me about the jungle. What did it smell like? What did it feel like when you were there? Were you scared in Vietnam uh, of getting shot or, you know, so I, I, you know, I guess the, the, the investigator, you know, mind helps really ask a lot of those questions. Now, Richard also assisted me by having all his stuff that he kept his whole life in a storage locker. So it's sort of like, well, the breadcrumbs to his life were right there after he passed. There were so many letters and notes, and, and it just gave me such an incredible insight into his life and his, his personal thoughts. There were letters, poems. Um, there, were, there were narratives that he had to write for the VA hospital, and they're asking him, why does he think he has PTSD? Because he was trying to get help for his PTSD. Uh, and you just hear him telling stories about things that happened to him in Vietnam and losing friends and going up and dropping grenades and spider holes. And when you pull it out, it's two VC women. And, you know, one of them has got a picture of her kid there. So what does that do to, you know, a person? And, and that's, I, I think that's an important lesson of the story is, you know, we do send our, you know, our husbands or wives, their brothers or sisters or sons and daughters off to war. What are we going to do when they come back? Cause they're going to, experience some pretty horrifying things and they're going to have to you know return back to civilian life at some point and what are we doing to make sure they make that transition i guess i didn't ask this directly but i mean the guy's got a storage locker for crying out loud he's going to the movies he's living a normal life why is he living under a tree how does he end up homeless and why doesn't somebody who has to be as resourceful as a green beret to survive in vietnam why why and how does he not get himself a roof or in a place to live it just doesn't add up he, he's had he's had roofs over his head. Matter of fact, his brother, who was an, an attorney, uh, once even bought him an apartment, but uh, he he couldn't stay indoors. Um, he, he just uh, th there's a story I just got. I mean, these stories just keep coming in. But there's a story of Richard right after Vietnam. 
as soon as he got out of Vietnam, he flew to Miami Beach and uh, a bunch of guys from where he grew up in Stanford, Connecticut were there partying. So Richard was maybe 24 or 23. And the guy who told me the story said, some tiny little guy who shows up who looks like a freshman in high school at, at the hotel. And I don't know anything about him, but the guy's got a limousine. We go out to Miami Beach and we're drinking and we're partying. And that was the night that Richard jumped on stage with B.B. King. B.B. King was doing a concert and Richard jumped on stage and was dancing next to B.B. Richard was a partier too. And he likes to have fun. He, uh, and then, but the, the interesting part of the story is they do all jump at the end of the night, jump back in the limo and Richard has them drop him off in a park because he couldn't sleep in the hotel. He just didn't feel safe. So he slept that night in the park instead of, uh, you know, I guess the jungle kind of really uh, fuck did with something to him. Yeah. Fuck with yeah. him. Yeah. So, okay. So he, he, he's homeless, but he's not homeless. Right. Like, I mean, I, is that important to the story at all? Is that important to, to know? Does that encapsulate him a little bit? Does it help you understand it a little bit better? You know, you, you also have the, you know, you have the thing, well, was, is he homeless by choice or is he homeless? Uh, he thinks it's by choice, but it's just, his mind just didn't get the help it needed because that's not normal to, to live outdoors like that. Uh, it's not an easy life to live out on the streets. Uh, Richard even got jumped and beat up uh, once or twice. It, it's a very difficult life. Uh, so it, it's really, a hard, that's one of the hardest questions, you know, I get asked is, you know, why was he homeless? Um, partially was his choice and partially was, I don't think it was his choice. He, he just couldn't help it. The damage was too deep. Uh, you know, as an officer, you don't really think about the pressure because Richard was initially he was a lieutenant uh, was in charge of a recon unit um, then as a Green Beret he was a captain but you don't really think about the pressure on a, an officer when you don't come home with all the guys that were under you like what you lost guys Richard I mean one of his first battles was during the the, the Tet Offensive when I think they had you know some of the worst losses on the American side so uh, that, that was his first battle. He just got to Vietnam and he was thrown into the middle of the Tet Offensive. So, you know, those guys, you know, there's, there's a story of a, a, a supermarket night manager that the supermarket was near Richard's tree that used to come out of work at sometimes two in the morning. And Richard was just in his sleep would just be screaming and fighting. And, you know, th those are demons. Uh, those are some pretty powerful demons. And, um, you know, early intervention for, for guys like that are probably, you know, the only way to save them from the streets, because once it gets to that point, you know, Richard, you're not getting them off the street. Let's talk a little bit more about Richard's life. Uh, obviously growing up, he's the shortest kid everywhere. Was he teased a lot? Did he, did he tell you about his childhood? What was that like for him always being the shortest kid? Yeah. He told me a little bit about it. Uh, his, his mom had a rare, a blood problem that I forgot how it went. I spoke to her doctor about it. She was RH positive. So what happens when you're the second born child, it, it could uh, attack your, your hormone system. So they knew early on, I mean, before Richard took his first breath, they knew that uh, either he wasn't going to make it or he, he was going to grow up to be a dwarf. And, and people want to know, was he technically a dwarf and medically? Yeah, he was. Um, so, yeah, he told me it was really uh, everywhere he went, people would stare at him everywhere he went, you know, people would laugh at him. And um, he, 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 he had a lot to prove. Um, I don't think he was a Napoleon guy where he had, you know, he's had a chip on his shoulder, but he would fight. You know, I spoke to his friends that he grew up with. And, and one thing about Richard is he wouldn't take much. He'd let you have one or two insults. And then that was it. He's throwing punches. So a uh, pretty uh, resilient little guy. I know he started training before people did back then in martial arts. He started training in martial arts, really toughening himself up. And uh, I think in high school, uh, he got a little bit more comfortable with it. Uh, I, you know, in high school, they called, I didn't come up with the name, the giant killer. That's actually his high school nickname. And oh, really? I it, yeah, because he, uh, there was a, a school bully that was, would pick on everybody, but certainly he, he liked Richard as a target. I think Richard took him out really bad one day. And then from then on, they called him the giant killer. 
Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, how does he come across the army? Was he drafted or did he enlist on his own? So, so Richard came from a whole family of war heroes. Matter of fact, his cousin is a Homer, uh, Homer Weiss is a Medal of Honor winner. His whole family, his uncle served in World War II. So he came from a, I mean, it must have been always in his mind that he wanted to serve his country. He wanted to do his part. Um, so, but, but no military w would allow him entry. Uh, most, you know, like the army, you have to be five feet tall, hundred pounds. So it took him three years of letter really? writing. I've been in the army 20 years. I never heard of that. Yeah, that was a height and size requirement. So he needed to get a, a waiver. I thought we uh, took everybody. I don't know today. This was, by some of the people I've served with, I feel like we have. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he had to get a he had to get a, a waiver from I think he was writing congressman and he got a three star general to finally say, give the guy a shot. If you can right. make it in basic, yeah. you can make it. If not, kick him out. I mean, it's it's that simple. So no, I don't, I don't think people really believe that he was going to be able to run with a, a backpack on that weighed as much as him or get over the walls and uh, do any of the obstacle courses or any of that stuff. I, I don't think anyone, you know, even thought about it, but he made it. Was there anything physically he struggled with that he told you about? I mean, even if it was something like you said, climbing over a wall where height just generally comes into play, or was he able just to adapt and overcome? So I spoke to guys who, who were in basic training with him. I spoke to guys who went through officer cannon school and uh, they said, if, if, you know, most guys ran three miles, Richard would run five miles. If the guys would do 30 pushups, Richard would do a hundred. So he wouldn't, he would only not only just get by, he would outcompete everybody. So he was, I mean, he was probably super, super athletic, like, like, you know, uh, like a gymnast type athletics, you know, just an incredible athlete. So when do when does the Green Beret situation come in? When does special operations come in for him? I mean, is that something he decided to do? Or was that more of, hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to prove myself to everybody type deal? So he, his first tour is with the 101st Airborne. Mm -hmm. And uh, after he returns uh, back to the United States after that, I think, yeah. I, you know, he said that uh, he wanted to test himself and he wanted to, you know, test himself with the best. So um, he, he joined and went through special forces school. And I think he actually, he went through the training, special forces training, then went back to, he was with the third special forces group, 46 company, which is based out of Thailand, which is, there's these guys that, uh, the, the, it's called Max, uh, Mac V Sog. Mm -hmm. And they're coming out now finally telling the stories that, yeah, we were in Laos and we were in Cambodia and we were all these things. And they're some of the most incredible, amazing heroes and stories. But the guys from the 46 Special Forces group, and I, I only spoke to two or three of them, one guy who served right after Richard, they're very hush-hush about what they're doing. They would recite out of, um, like out of a book every time I would ask them, like, okay, what was your you know, what were you guys doing there? And they're like, we were there to train the Thai border patrol and that they wouldn't say anything else. I, I've had other guys, you know, special forces guys saying, no, those guys were also crossing the border, but they, they signed the contract, uh, not only with the army, not to talk, ever talk about it, but would also with Thailand, which I guess Thailand treated them really good. And um, there to this day, it's, it's very hard to get any of those guys from the 46 to really give you anything more than you know, we train Thai Border Patrol, which seems kind of ridiculous for, you know, why would you send the best trained Green Berets over there to do something anybody could train? Yeah, we, we've actually interviewed a, a Mac V SOG guy uh, here on the Hazard Ground. So uh, I'm a little familiar with uh, that story and, and what they've done. Really interesting stuff. Uh, but as he uh, completes, you know, special forces training, um, does he get any notoriety within the military for what he's done? Or is he somebody who shied away from it? I mean, obviously he stands out. And like you said, so many people remember everything about him because you'll never forget the four foot nine guy. Like you know, anything you do, you're just, there was a guy who was so short. Like you'll always remember that um, more than I think you will, you know, a noticeable scar or somebody's ethnic background or whatever that just always sticks out with you. So um, what was that, you know, was he starting to get, recognition in the military for who he was a strange thing the military does and if you look on google it seems like it's been going on since the 1900s for some reason they always pose the tallest guy with the shortest guy so that's 
there's one famous picture of Richard and it was in all the magazines. So he, he did get a little bit of notoriety, but he was, um, he wasn't really big into the notoriety. Um, to this day, obviously people, you know, some people still remember that tiny little guy. Um, but I, I mean, the big disappointment was he comes back after his year in Thailand and they have the reduction in force, uh, the RIF, uh, which, you know, they're downsizing the military and the first guys to not get their contracts renewed are the officers. So Richard's real dream after his tour in uh, Thailand was to uh, go into training. And he wanted to teach, you know, the, the new guys what he learned. And that unfortunately didn't happen with the RIF and, you know, Richard wasn't the only guy. And you do hear a lot of stories about those are the guys who went over to uh, Rhodesia and other countries to, to give their services. You know, they, they kind of felt a little bit let down by the country. Uh, Richard was a patriot till the end, till, the, you know, that day in May 9th, 2015. Uh, he hated communism uh, with a passion. And he, uh, from what he told me and from other people told me, if there was communism spreading somewhere. He wanted to be there to stop it. I mean, right at the end, I forgot what years it was. He, he was trying to get over to uh, Iraq to, to rejoin the army. And he was, I guess, in his late fifties at the time. Uh, he did make it to Iraq. I, I found that on his passport, but it wasn't with the army. What was he doing there? Nobody knows. You know, so we're assuming he was a private military contractor, maybe just doing training, but Nobody really has explained, you know, why he was in Iraq in maybe it was 2003 or 2005. Yeah, uh, there, there's no communism in Iraq, that I can tell you. Uh, he, he might have been geographically misguided, uh, I, I kid. But uh, this is also a guy that has two Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, and a Silver Star. So let's start with the Purple Hearts. How is he wounded? What happened? Do you know? Actually, the, the, I think he was wounded four times, but he, he told me he only got two because I looked at his, his medical records and I know uh, he had some shrapnel in his leg. Uh, he had shrapnel in his back. Um, I know his eardrums were punctured for, from some explosions. The one thing that other guys that served with him said that, you know, when there was a concussion or an explosion, you know, maybe you get knocked back a few feet, but Richard would fly 10 feet away. It would just really... He didn't have the body mass. Um, he took it pretty tough. Those 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 explosions and RPGs. Um, but from from what I remember, it's mostly from shrapnel. Um, I think he had a, a grenade uh, shrapnel in his in his right leg, and uh, he had some shrapnel in his back. I know he had a a bad jumping injury when he was in training. Uh, there's a, there's another guy who wrote a book about Richard. Uh, wrote a book about his his time as a Green Beret and he mentioned going to uh, Special Forces school with Flaherty and that you know during one jump Flaherty really hurt his back bad but so he, he had some injuries. When it comes to his Silver Star uh, do you know what have you seen the citation do you know what it's all about? Yeah they, they um, yeah I, I ha actually have this citation um, they, they encountered a fortified enemy bunker and it was really chewing up um, his platoon and Richard rushed the bunker and took a lot of the enemy fire off of them. And he order, ordered uh, something I never heard of, a, a 90 millimeter recoilless rifle. So he ordered that up while he was taking the, um, uh, distracting them with the fire and they were able to take out the bunker and complete their mission. But uh, supposedly he put himself in harm's way numerous times in that little fight. Does he indicate how combat may have been easier for him because of his tiny stature? I mean, was he able to hide easier? Was he able to avoid things easier? Well, he, 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 he you know, it's funny because remember I said, like, I asked him, were you afraid in Vietnam? And he said, you know, I'm not trying to be you know, brag, but honestly, I wasn't. I'm not trying to be my, he said, I, I just felt like my size would be an advantage. I felt like maybe they would even think I'm a VC. Um, there was a time when a couple of the guys got lost behind, uh, enemy lines that he, he did actually put on a, a VC uniform, uh, and went out there to look for them. And, um, whether, you know, <laughs> whether they really believed, you know, he, he, he was a Viet Cong or something. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, NVA or, you know, um, right. But he, he did some crazy stuff. Was there any story that you heard about him? that you found or you just didn't believe that you couldn't verify? 
I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a couple of them that I didn't put in the documentary or book. I can't, they, they don't come to me now, but no, I, I vetted. There, there were some people that made some really outlandish. Richard would never, well, I mean, okay. So, so what, you know, another piece of Richard is that I, I mean, I believe it's mental illness was that he felt the um, Homeland security was after him or department of defense was after him all the time and chasing him on the streets. And usually You'll hear that with guys saying the CIA is after me, but with Richard, I believe he was saying, I'm trying to think of, um, I think it was Department of Homeland Security, he would say we're monitoring him. And, and that was just too far for me. I, I wasn't, it's like, Richard, why, why would, you know, why are they going to bother you 50 years later? Uh, there was even one day, there was one strange day. I, I, I do a lot of, you know, I've done a couple of these interviews. I've never talked about this, but there was one strange day that uh, in, in, the, in the last week of his life, that we were meeting, you know, and I was taking all my notes and asking him those millions of questions. So after the after the meeting, and you know, it seemed like you know we were we were at Boston Market eating chicken. So as we walked out, Richard turned to me and said, "You know, don't think I, I don't know who you really are." I was like, what are you talking about Richard, he goes, "I know you're one of them. You want you you're not a cop. You're 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 a federal agent, and, and this is a whole. You know, you're just you're just um, you you're just doing uh, um, surveillance on me." And I really felt horrible at that point in time. When he said that to me, I felt really terrible. And I said, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe he's compromised mentally too much for me to be asking him for his life story. Maybe this is wrong of me to be questioning him and, and maybe putting him through this. And, and, and I really, I was beyond super uncomfortable that, you know, I'm friends with him for 15 years and here he is accusing me of somebody that he's saying are, you know, causing him harm. So I, I really, really was shaken up when he said that to me. And I, I didn't, I didn't know what we were supposed to meet the next day for coffee at, at a gas station was the plan. And I didn't know if he was going to show up because that's how we left it. He walked away from me and he said, you know, I know who you really are. I know what this is. And I'm like, oh shit. So, um, we met, I, I showed up at the gas station and lo and behold, he walked in and acted like everything was fine. Um, my only guess is I spoke to a guy who was friends with him throughout the seventies and eighties. And he would say, Richard would constantly test people and test their loyalty and question them. And, and really he would just, he would do that every once in a while. But, and I'm assuming he just, I don't know. He just threw it out there to see my reaction. What is the most um, troubling is not the right word because I, I don't want, you know, you've indicated some of the, the mental stuff that has gone on. But when, when you think about Richard's entire story, is there something that sort of sticks with you that just doesn't feel right about it? Is, is there something that, that doesn't uh, add up for you or, or does it all just kind of have a little bit of, you know, um, you know, this is the arc of the guy's life and this is how it went sort of deal just sort of fits, if that makes sense. You know, there's always a there's always a little bit of danger for me looking too deep into his life because uh, when I when I made the documentary, I wanted to make sure that I didn't put him too much on, on a pedestal. I left some some pretty rough things on there. You know, there were some guys saying that Richard was pretty tough on the enemy in Vietnam. He really wasn't um, taking too many prisoners when you know when the opportunity. So that that was kind of there. There were some dark things in there. And then there's always, you know, when I'm following up his trail, you know, later in life and he's traveling all over the world and doing things that nobody knows, well, what exactly is he doing? So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I try to accept him for, for who he is. And, you know, I, I hope, I mean, I, I won't, I won't not turn over a rock for the fear that I might just learn something bad. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, you got to take on a man's life. You know, you, I don't think it's fair to tell his story unless you tell it honestly. After you wrote the book and did the documentary, um, was there anybody from his family that reached out? Was there anybody who was super close to him that reached out either just to say thank you or had some sort of contrary notion of what you had learned? Was anybody angry about what you had wrote? Great question. Uh, so Richard was only close. He, he's... Um, pretty sad. And I hate to bring this up. Uh, he, he had a falling out with his brother. 
his older brother, Walter, and they didn't speak for 10 years before his death. Matter of fact, Walter was one of the first guys that I interviewed. And I know it would have been against Richards, but, you know, he, he, he said some tough things about his brother, but, um, you know, but how, how do you know what's real and what's not? So I was very, very glad that I spoke to his brother and I didn't get any animosity and his brother seemed to really care. Um, but his brother was having some health problems too at the time that I interviewed him. But uh, Richard was close to his two cousins. He had uh, Donna Marlin and, and uh, Jeannie Rinaldi or his two cousins that he, he would keep in touch with. That was really about the only people in his life that he would keep in touch with. And they really, I went up to Stanford and they really, um, they really were great and they were really warm and they were really open. Um, I haven't encountered any, anybody yet from the family or friends that, you know, is upset at me. Uh, I thought I was going to get, uh, I got her just recently contacted uh, those two green berets that were doing the under that were caught in that undercover operation, stealing explosives. Um, one passed away and the other one I spoke to, Oh, actually here, here's one. Um, I, I spoke to one of those green berets that went to jail that he was supposed to go to jail for 40 years on that case, ended up doing like 10, and it was the most uncomfortable conversation. You know, here I am cold calling this guy and his first words were, you know, Richard Flaherty ruined my life. He set me up. This thing was a CIA operation. We were supposed to be getting weapons down to Central America and Richard, you know, set me up. He ruined my life. That was a really, really tough, uncomfortable phone call. Yeah, that's one guy who, who hated Richard. Um, but then I, I got contacted, the other guy, the other Green Beret that passed, his daughter contacted me and I was like, oh my God, this is not going to be good because, you know, in the documentary, I, I put the facts out there of what they got arrested for and, and you know, all the, the, the facts of the case. And uh, no, she wasn't upset at all. She was, you know, it, it, it was what it was. And she wanted to know if I had any other information about her father. Um, you know, the, the, the rule of for me as a cop is uh, once a guy does his time, he starts new. So those two grain braves in my book, once they did their time, uh, they were good. Uh, I didn't have any issue with them. You know, once a man or a woman does her time, you got to, why release them back in society if, if you're never going to yeah. uh, give them a chance again? When, when you had talked to the Green Braves, said it was a CIA operation, was there any truth to what he was saying or he was at this point just sort of delusional about what he was really doing? That's super, super tough. I mean, because Agent Gleffy and then the, the federal prosecutors that I interviewed man, they were just saying it's so rock solid, rock solid, rock solid, that it, it couldn't be anything else. But you, and you look at those- Taught you that, that it's usually not the case. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I, 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 had a, I had and I still have a great uh, um, personal relationship with Agent Gleffy, and he's one of the hardest working, honest people uh, I, I've ever met and most you know, incredible investigators. When I interviewed him for the documentary, this guy showed up. 40 years later with every file every note pristine from that case i mean like, that's a that's a real real pro i mean i was never that much of a pro but this guy showed up and he had i mean stacks and stacks of files uh from that case and his memory was was really sharp uh is there a chance that there were other layers to that case yeah of course there are there's many different layers to some of these crazy stories I don't know, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I usually give the, 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 the BS answer that, you know, the truth somewhere lies in the middle, but I don't know. I, I would say, you know, it's much greater chance that, uh, that, that they, they did the crimes that they were arrested for and um, maybe a very small chance that it was a CIA operation, small. We've all watched enough uh, investigation discovery and, and murder crime shows to know uh, when a cop is interviewing somebody that they, they kind of already know the answers to the questions that they're asking. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I say that tongue in cheek, but, you know, the investigative antenna that you have during this process, I know you talked a little bit about some of the stories, but was there anything that uh, Richard told you or any story that you came upon where you're sort of investigative antenna pops up and you're like, you know, you just had to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Was there, was there something that, 
uh, you know, a story that that sort of just really had you working overtime uh, more than usual? You know, I tried to, I, I think, I think everything, I got really bogged down with that ATF case, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when Richard started telling me about the SADM. Um, that really, it took me a while to really unwind things. And I couldn't get, I couldn't get corroboration from anyone, any other federal agents that worked on that case. It finally, somebody did, and I don't want to, you know, they, I gave them my confidence. I wouldn't, but I, you know, enough where I felt comfortable about it to write it on the book, but that one, that, that undercover operation really bogged me down. And I guess, especially going after that nuclear device, because, you know, Richard said it kind of, I never heard of a SATAM. I never heard of a miniature nuclear weapon. And do I need to know that, that there's possibly people running around with miniature nuclear weapons to detonate them? You know, we think about terrorism, like these things are floating around too. That I got, I got to worry about this shit too. So um, that, that, that's probably what, what took the most time. And it, it's, it was a tough case to investigate. Uh, as far as the military is concerned, I know you, he said he had, you said he had a lot of his records. Did you have to petition them for anything? And the bureaucracy there has got to be millions of miles long, as I well know. But I mean, were they tough to deal with if you had to work with them? Uh, no, I mean, he really did have almost everything. I mean, I... I all his military records he kept. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I did contact the CIA and uh, Homeland Security and Department of Defense. And, you know, I got the standard. We can neither confirm nor deny the existence of Richard Flaherty. <laughs> so uh, those were all dead ends. You know, there, there wasn't anything to go on there. But, the military... it, but apparently Google can. So, yeah, thank, <laughs> yeah. thanks for my tax dollars going to good use. Uh, yeah. We appreciate it. But uh, so you make the book and... Um, you decided to do the documentary. I know you said before with the documentary, you just sort of winged it. What do you mean winged it and how and why? And, and you know, what, what, why did, why do the video version of this thing? I thought it would, I, I think, I thought it would be easier than the book. Um, you know, we had a lot of news footage, uh, you know, when he got killed and they, I, you know, I just thought that was the starting point uh, of it. Um, and plus, you know, I, I did want to keep video records of, of this investigation of his life. So, you know, even if I just was going to write the book, I still would have recorded these journeys and these interviews that I did. So it ended up working out right. I think it came out all right for the documentary. Um, but but I think that was my thought process, just to try to get things on audio or get them on video for, you know, for just safekeeping. What was the hardest part about putting the documentary together? You said you thought it was going to be easier. What was the hardest part? It, there was so many times I was going to quit. I mean, there was just so many times. I mean, it, it just, you know, there was so many of the technical aspects. Like, okay, great. You, you shoot a movie on video, but, but then what happens? And then how do you edit it? And then how do you get it distributed? And then, you know, how do you, there's so many terms. You're so behind on the learning curve of a filmmaker that maybe went to school for this or, they were, you know, training and other aspects of it, but there were so many frustrating uh, aspects of getting the project over the finish line. It, it just, you know, there was just days I was like, this is, a, it felt like I was climbing a mountain and then I was like, oh, I'm at the top. And then, no, 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 you got 20 more feet to go and you go 20 more feet. Like, no, 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 go 50 more feet. And you're like, can't do it. But, you know, like quitting wasn't really, um, uh, you know, something I could do. Uh, I couldn't do that for Richard. So, I, you know, I just, I don't know how it got done. I, I just kept pushing and pushing. And then just one day I just somehow was past the finish line and I was like, Oh shit, it's done. But it was, it's a very difficult road. I mean, it is two years. I don't know. We filmed for, yeah, we filmed for maybe six months and it was maybe two years of, of editing. And remember, so I have four, I don't know, 40 hours worth of video footage, but how do you put it all together? Who's going to tell me what, how do you start the story? How do you, what's the middle of it? What's the end? I mean, you know, I'm looking at the 40 hours of footage. I remember that's, you know, you want to talk about the day I was going to quit. I was like, okay, now what do I do? Because nobody's like, you know, for free going to help me like say, Oh yeah, I got nothing better to do. Let me come by your house and we'll go over this 40 hours of video. Um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't something I was trying to get other filmmakers involved and you were like, I got no interest in this. So, uh, you know, you learn as you go, you fake it till you make it. And 
that's kind of how it went. What are the details of the hit and run that killed Richard? Well, uh, the, 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 that night, uh, Richard was crossing the street. Uh, I forgot off the top of my head. I forgot maybe it was 1230 at night, 1230 AM, uh, the morning of May 9th. Uh, he was crossing the street, uh, 50 yards away from his tree. Um, he got struck by, uh, car that launched him into the air. He hit his head on the, the front um, windshield. He cracked the uh, little side window of a, a Prius. His head smashed the window. He flew. He had his backpack on. His backpack flew. His shoes flew off. He landed in the, he landed in the median. Um, his body landed in the median and the car uh, fled. Uh, a bunch of joggers found him in the morning. The first thing they saw was a sneaker, a bloody sneaker in the street. And then uh, they walked up to the median and they just saw the, you know, his body, most of his body was uncovered. I think part, he was partially covered in some of the weeds. Um, they went um, sadly to the the fire rescue house that used to take care of Richard saying, Hey, this, there's a guy on the ground over there. And those guys you know, recognized him immediately when they went over there and then they knew he was gone and they called my police department. So um we had no leads on the suspect, you know, we were pulling video and we were taking pieces of the vehicle. And we were, the most shocking thing is we were looking for skid marks. And usually, you know, on a hit and run like that, you're going to see, even if the person is um, DUI, uh, when you strike somebody, you either slam on the brakes or you swerve your wheel or, but the strange part of this was there was no skid marks. So like, you know, I, I wasn't a vehicle vehicular homicide detective, but you know our guys are uh, were pretty experienced to know it's, it's very rare not to see any skid marks unless it was done on purpose. Um, extraordinary accusations need extraordinary proof. I never found any extraordinary proof that uh, the person who ended up being a uh, a woman working for another police department she uh, she worked for a homicide unit as a stenographer. Uh, struck him that night, uh, drove home, um, checked the front of her car when she got home, because we got that on video, uh, parking surveillance video, walked back to the crime scene uh, with her intention to find out what struck her car, because she claimed she didn't know what hit her car, uh, despite Richard's head bashing off her windshield. Uh, she claimed she didn't see anybody in the median, although you know other witnesses said that uh, he was clearly, you know, you could have seen him. And the woman knew where she was in the accident. She went home. She called her insurance at like 2 a.m. Try to get insurance to come out there first thing in the morning and fix the car. She walked back to the crime scene in the morning, uh, saw the, the body being covered with a tarp and, you know, bystanders and cops and uh, news media out there. And she didn't mention anything to anybody. She waited till later that day. She was going into work on a Saturday. And when she got to work, she spoke to one of her bosses and said, hey, would you check my car? I, I might have been in an accident. And the guy walked out and he saw blood and hair on the car. And uh, he said, uh, you know, yeah, you, you struck someone. And he contacted my police department. And that's how it went. What did they end up charging her with? Nothing. What? Nothing. She didn't get a ticket. She didn't get in trouble. Uh, state attorney's office, Florida state attorney's office refused to press charges despite my department wanting to arrest her uh, for even some of the minimal of leaving scene of accident, great injury. And the state attorney's office felt that uh, her testimony that she didn't know what she hit allowed her to walk. So uh, nothing happened to her. She made recent news uh, about six months ago, maybe less, maybe five months ago. Uh, worldwide news. She was in, uh, involved in a DUI accident in Boca Raton and went on a, a viral rant, uh, uh, anti-Semitic viral rant. Um, the thing is, this is, uh, I, I mean, she's not, uh, it's not going to uh, bring back Richard. Uh, I don't live my life to torment her. I don't do anything. Her life is sad enough as is as a human being. Um, I don't think she even realizes, you know, what it means to kill somebody. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about the woman. I don't want to know anything about the woman. 
Uh, I can see from that viral video that she's still mentally deranged. And um, I, I don't I don't have anything to say about her except for, you know, I, I, uh, I celebrate Richard's life and, and uh, I don't try, I try not to think about too much of his death. Wow. Okay. Well, in that case, we won't uh, won't spend any more time there. Obviously, not what you're here to uh, to discuss. So, um, what do you think Richard would say uh, if he saw the documentary and read the book? Uh, he would be pissed off because <laughs> one of the promises, besides the the if we start the project, we got to finish it. Is if it's made into a movie, his quote was a million dollars, which I don't have. <laughs> That's what he wanted for <laughs> for his, and then he also he made me promise for a tree. Yeah, yeah, and then he also made me promise if it's, if it's a, a feature film that uh, Brad Pitt has to play him in the movie. Yeah, that, I don't that's know. Work. Yeah, I don't know if Brad's going to be doing that. So, uh, that what would Richard? I, I hope I hope he would be proud. I, I hope he would. Um, you know, he he wanted to tell his life story. He wanted me to to get it out there to the world. I, I think he felt. Uh, now is the time to tell it. So I, I, I mean, I hope I didn't let him down. Uh, you know, I hope, I hope I, you know, and not just him and all those guys who, you know, from the 101st Airborne and all the, the Green Berets and all those other amazing people I met on the journey and his friends and people grew up. I hope I don't let those people down. Uh, I did the best I could. That's, that's it. Did you ever ask him, I mean, look, you made this, this book when Richard died in 2015, you said, correct? So I, I made the book after the, the documentary because my plan was never through. I mean, I didn't know how I was going to tell it, but it was only because after the documentary, I got contacted by so many people with um, new stories. And I was like, right. oh my God, I got I to gotta fill this in. I got to fill in because there was so many missing pieces in the documentary um, that, that I, I felt that I needed to answer those questions. But like I, I, the, the date that you made the documentary was, was what year? Uh, I, I released it initially in 2018. Right. So you started what, 2015, I think you said? 2015. Was? Yeah. I mean, okay. it was a couple well, months after he passed. Sure. I, I sat on my ass for a while saying, you know, I'm not going to do a story on his life now. He's dead. Uh, there's no, it's over. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm just, I give up. But, you know, that, that little voice, you know, and then the stuff in Richard's storage locker just made me keep going forward and just one step at a time. The reason I ask is because, you know, 2015 at this point in time, you know, we have Lone Survivor, we have American Sniper, we have Black Hawk Down, we have Saving Private Ryan, we, we have all these other stories that are out there about military people and everything that has gone on, and yet Richard never tells his story to anybody but you, and you had known him for 15 years did you ever ask him, Richard, why me? Why are you telling me after all these years when, I mean, clearly he was smart enough to know that he could have used a variety of different outlets to get his story out there if he wanted it. Um, I, I don't really know, except for the fact that Richard didn't trust many people. He had very, very deep, uh, you know, mistrust of everyone, uh, paranoia. So maybe I was just, you know, maybe he just, I was the only guy who talked to him on a regular basis. Maybe it's just that deep feeling of trust. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't certainly don't think Richard's goal in life was to tell his life story. I think it just kind of happened at the end that I think, you know, he also had uh, stage four cancer on the top of his head that he attributed to Agent Orange. Um, I think he knew whose time was running, running out uh, one way or the other. Uh, and I think he wanted to get the story off his, his shoulders right at the end. You know, I, I don't believe in uh, the afterlife or sixth sense or, you know, anything that you can't prove is kind of hard to, but I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to say that how, you know, that he, he confessed his life story to me, you know, 10 days before he was killed. It, it's pretty strange timing. Um, there's one photo that I put in the documentary that that was pretty strange. It was from like two nights before he was killed. I never really took any pictures with Richard or um, of Richard. I, I only took one video of him of one night. We were just on a bench and I just said, hey, Richard, let me just get this on my phone. Because when when I initially approached him about doing some sort of story on him, I, I, I thought I had all the time in the world. But I, I one day I did pull out my phone and do a little video. 
that's there in the documentary. But I took this picture of him sleeping under his tree two days before he was killed. And when you look at the picture, it's so bizarre that there was a, a light coming off a, a street lamp and it points exactly to where he would be killed two nights later as he's sleeping. And it's just one of those bizarre things. What do you miss the most about his friendship? Uh, we laugh, uh, we, we, you know, we, we would, we laugh and uh, it just, I, re I remember just like whenever world politics was going on, you know, cause he would read the newspaper every, I would just always ask him, oh, what do you, what do you think is going to happen here? What do you think? So it was just, uh, it, it was really, it was kind of bizarre, but it was sort of like a mentor um, relationship because once we started talking, Richard was teaching me, he was teaching me about the world. He would talk to me about philosophy. He would ask me the, the crazy one, what's the sound of one hand clapping bullshit and always make me answer some sort of, you know, questions about life and philosophy. And, 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 you know, um, there's another great Richard story that uh, one day we were sitting having lunch and he was like, my boy, I'm going to tell you the, the answer to, to, all, to all life's mysteries. And I was like, okay, Richard, what, what's the answer? So he goes, the key to life is um, money in the bank calms nerves. And he was, he made me repeat that like five times. <laughs> Just money in the bank calms nerves. Money in the bank calms. Well, yeah, appreciate that, Richard. That was his philosophy. Was he a guy who had money in the bank? You know, I had his bank accounts, and there were times, <laughs> there were times, sometimes where he did have some money, maybe three thousand, maybe five thousand, and there was times when there was like fifty dollars in his bank account. So, uh, you know, he had a little pension from the uh, the army. I think he was getting. Like, 500 bucks a month which you know covered food and whatever medications he needed but uh no the, the, i mean there really there really wasn't much money that uh, i mean unless there's some crazy offshore account that i never found um because there, there's so many but i mean i could we could be here for 10 days and i could tell you bizarre richard stories that last week of his life uh maybe three days before he was killed he, you know, I was working my shift and he asked me to come meet him at this condominium. It's you know, a pretty nice condominium. I was like, oh, why, why do I got to meet you? you? Just just come here and meet me. So I went up there and there he is in this really nice apartment. Not super. It was like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar apartment. And he's like, well, well, what do you think? I was like, what are we doing here, Richard? He goes, well, I'm going to buy it. I was like, what are you talking about? You're going to buy it? He goes, well, you know, I, I've come into some money and I'm going to buy it. And it's just such a bizarre thing. A couple of days before he was killed and and I asked him, I said, well, what do you, you know, and he told me, well, I got this old friend that's in real estate and he owes me money. And um, I interviewed the guy after, and the guy didn't know I was going to ask him that question. And the guy said, absolutely not. I didn't, I was going to buy Richard. I have apartments. I rent them. I would give Richard an apartment. I've offered him cheap apartments to rent. You know, he was my friend, but no, I wasn't buying him an apartment. So what was that about? Fuck if I know. <laughs> Uh, any other lingering questions like that that you you weren't able to answer? I mean, uh, look, I mean, there's a million. There's there's, well, there's, there's, there's there are more loose ends you haven't been able to tie up. Or there's a million loose. I, there's there's people in Thailand he was sending money to. There's all these trips he went to Venezuela twice to Puerto La Cruz in in the 2000s when he had no money and it's a super dangerous place. What was he doing? Um, there's a million richer you know he was in cambodia and thailand also when he was homeless uh, he was everywhere i mean what would he would he would go to north dakota in the middle of the winter and he hated the cold and he would go like every three years he'd go on that same week that he would stay in this one hotel in north dakota fly or drive fly he would fly and what was he doing there i mean i i I called North Dakota and I called reporters and I called cops and I was like, what in those, what in that week's time was so important that he would be there? And I thought maybe there was a gun show or something or some sort of military parade or but it was the middle of, of winter in North Dakota and nobody knows. That's crazy. See, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you got my mind racing a little bit. Um, uh, e either there really is just some sort of mental disposition that isn't hundred uh, percent where it needs to be, or, or it just, you know, that, that doesn't drive you nuts as a, as a cop, not being able to, to get those answers. <laughs> it makes me crazy. It makes, it makes me so effing crazy that, 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 you know, cause I just want to know, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid, 
but I, I still do want to know what, like, what was he doing on those trips? What was he doing in Venezuela, you know, in a really dangerous area? Um, I don't know. You know, when he, when he was younger and he got out of the military, he worked for, it wasn't Bushmaster at the time. It eventually got purchased and, and uh, turned into the company Bushmaster Rifle. But he worked for that the, a gentleman named Mac Wynn Jr. Who was, oh, Mac Wynn Sr. I'm sorry. I spoke to Mac Wynn Jr. That was the CEO of the company. I know Richard was in arms sales, you know, so I don't know. Was he still selling arms? Uh, he told his cousin that he was taking care of people that owed him money, that there were people that owed him money that needed to be taken care of. And that's what he was doing on this trip. So it's his, it's so crazy. Well, it kind of ties back into the arms deal that he caught the other Green Berets in, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very similar pattern there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, is there anything you're still working on with him? Or because the book is done and the, and the documentary is done, it's all put to bed and you're you're willing to let sleeping dogs lie? I, I, every time I've tried to let it lie, somebody will contact me with some new crazy. And there are some, there is a really angle that I, I you know, I'm thinking about. There was, there was a guy who I don't want to name right now, uh, a very famous politician that was in those meetings in that um, undercover operation that his name has been protected um, all these years. And I, I know who it is and I could approach that person. And I don't know, I, I've talked to other people about it. Um, that, that might be something that, uh, that, that could be the biggest rabbit hole. And I, I don't, at this point in time, I'm 52 years old. I just had my second back surgery, just got, two epidurals yesterday i'm all more beat up i, I need to just relax <laughs> uh but you you know there's part of you that's gonna eventually want to get these questions answered right like i'm talking to you now and i can look at you and i and i can tell that th th this isn't finished for you you might take a break but i don't think <laughs> i think i'm taking a break but yeah you're right i i just it's all right when is the story going to end? I don't know if it does. I don't know if the Richard Flaherty story really ever ends. Yeah, man, I'm I'm feeling like there's a second documentary coming. I, I'm not lying here. I, you know, I, I think there's more that uh, that you're going to find out here. That that, and I'm morbidly curious at this point. Uh, obviously, the crazy thought of me following his footsteps to Iraq because I know where he was in Iraq and I know where he was in Venezuela. I know where he was in Cambodia, and I have hotel receipts and I have. I could follow his track, including flying up to North Dakota and, and some of the other strange places he went to. Yeah, that that's come across my mind. But like I said, man, be careful what you look for, because, uh, well, I mean, if you give a shit, if you, if you don't, I mean, doing a documentary is, is such a big mountain to climb. I, I'm respectful of that mountain now. I was just too dumb when I started it to know, like how, not know how much hard work it would be. So, it was, you know, I'm a little wiser now to know that maybe don't poke that there. If you weren't a cop, would accessing a lot of this information be more difficult? Were you able to get things just because you had and you knew people who ran these systems and everything else? Yeah, 100 percent. It would it would have been I mean, yeah, it could have been done. But, yeah, you would have need a good investigation team like the, the team right. was me. I mean, it was just me. My dad would help me when he could. Um, but there was, you know, it was. Uh, really greatly helped with, with, and the same thing is, you know, I don't know if, if, if those military guys would have just talked to some reporter and, you know, a lot of the people that opened up to me, maybe they felt a little more comfortable that I was a cop and, you know, I tried to do the best I could and, and my, uh, my reasons were, were valid. You got to go to Iraq, dude, and figure out what's going on. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, only if you're going to watch my back, man. I, I need some, I need some protection. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. I, 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 need, I need somebody watching my back. This old man can't <laughs> do what he used to anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's it, it's crazy to think. And I guess the, the one thing um, that keeps going through my mind is how does one person do all this and keep it quiet for so long? Like, we're at an age at this point where you leave a footprint everywhere you go, as you've just alluded to, digital and otherwise. How does somebody continue to do all this under relatively, um, you know, conspicuous circumstances at, that nobody seems to know about for X, Y, and Z reasons? Like, there's just too so many I, I got something for you. you okay. You're digging for something good. 
No, I'm just so, saying. So I'm we had a, no, listen, we had, we had a guy that my the guy wouldn't talk to me, but my dad ended up having a good, um, uh, um, just won the guy's trust over. And the guy gave us a deathbed confession of, of um, some of the stuff, him and Flaherty. He, he was the guy who talked to us a lot about uh, Africa and Rhodesia and some of the missions and Richard doing undercover operations. So I have that recording and someday I'm going to release it. There, there's some crazy stuff he talks about, stuff that I had to even pass on to other law enforcement people because he's talking about open murders, not that he did, but that he had uh, knowledge of. And I just need to make sure that these are not open cases. So uh, someday I'm going to release that, that, that audio um, of this guy that gives that, that confession. And it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. But the point I was going to make is he would talk about how cautious Richard was 24 seven about covering his trail, covering his tracks. And I think Richard, his whole life, really covered his trail and his tracks and he was certainly kept off the grid and you know nowadays yeah it'd be a little harder to stay off the grid but you know for as long as he could um i think he laid low did he have a cell phone i mean does that have a contact with you yeah he did yeah yeah the homeless guy with a cell phone he would recharge it at the supermarket it was a little flip phone but oh, yeah, it must have been a Nokia where you played Snake, you know, that doesn't have everything that uh, tracks everywhere you go all day long. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing is, I mean, in police work, we'd call them burner phone, phones or throw down phones. But that's one of the things I found in, in his uh, storage locker was he had about four uh, other phones in packages uh, on top of cryptic notes and, um, you know, his passport, cryptic notes. He had... Uh, uh, language uh, books in Arabic and all, all so everything from a spy movie Richard had in this one little uh, box in his, in his storage locker. So I, I don't know. Oh come on, man! This is just too creepy. This is weird. There's more. You know, there, there was a there's a record. It's not in the document. There, there was a, a little recorder, one of those little uh, cassette, those mini cassette player recorders. I found, and uh, I found. Well, of course, you push play. Of course, I push play. So I was it, man. I got it. Richard is going to confess to everything. He's going to tell me every <laughs> mystery of life on this thing. So I start listening. For 45 minutes straight, I hear like what sounds like a leaf blower or some sort of mechanical thing just going. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. I flip over the tape. Leaf blower again. 45 minutes. Right at the you can see the tape is about to run out right at the tape. Richard's voice comes on. And he finally, I'm, I'm, as soon as he, I, I get chills because I know he's about to give me every answer. Because I, I just, I found the tape at the end, the, the recorder, you know, at the end of my investigation was like at the beginning. So I was like, holy shit. If I would have found this recorder earlier, I would have known everything. He's about to confess. Here it is. You know, what he was doing, who he's working for. And all he says is... Uh, uh, almost at the end of the tape, uh, I'm in the middle of watching an episode of Matlock. Uh, time to you know stop recording. And it was the most bizarre, and that's so Richard Flaherty. Wow. Any any did he ever speak to the VA? Or was he ever did he ever go to see the VA hospital or anything? Yes. Yeah. He he went several times. Um, like I said, he thought you he had evaluations, or you weren't able to access that. No, I would. I have his medical stuff. And that's when he was claiming he had PTSD and he wanted help. And there are, you know, uh, like five or 10 pages handwritten in his notes talking about things that he saw. And, uh, yeah, he was talking about his injuries and, and his loss of hearing and his hands weren't working well. That was one thing about Richard is he, he wouldn't, he would never shake hands one because his hands were so tiny. And also he said that, you know, he had them broken and, combat you know his fingers broken stuff like that but when when i asked him if we can do this project and then he you know he said hey if you start it you finish it that was the one and only time he ever shook my hand and obviously i took you know I took made sure I, I didn't squeeze his hand too hard but that was the only time i shook his hand um any sense that he needed a mental diagnosis that he never got uh, it came, if it did, it, it, it would have been too many years too late. He needed early intervention. Uh, when I started interviewing these guys, these other, uh, vets, they all had the same issues as Richard, but the guys who kept the train on the tracks, you know, I, 
I'm, it seemed like it was those three F's, uh, family, faith, and friendship that kept the, you know, the, the, the train on the tracks when, when they were starting to go off the deep end. Cause a lot of those guys would tell me, man, they, they, they just dreamed of just walking off into the woods and not having to deal with people anymore, but their families kept them or their religious you know beliefs kept them or their friends. Um, and, uh, for some reason, Richard didn't have those connections. I, you know, there, there's some pretty sad things in his life. He had a fiance who was in a one car accident. Um, when Richard got back from the war, he was about to get married and she got killed in a car accident. Um, and then there was another woman that he's buried next to. The, the interesting thing about Richard Flaherty and his whole family of heroes and, you know, um, everyone always thinks that, you know, he, his only dream would probably want to be in Arlington's National Cemetery. Well, he knew he was qualified to be buried in Arlington years before he was killed. And he instead, he, he instead purchased a, a small um, cemetery plot in a kind of an anonymous um, uh, cemetery in West Virginia, just to be next to the woman he loved. So, uh, you know, at the end, that was more important to him than any military burial. Uh, and that's where, he's, where he is today. Do you ever stop to think that maybe you were the family, friend, and faith that he needed at, in the latter part of his life? You know, that, that last week, the last week of his life, he was actually upbeat, except for that one weird thing where he accused me. Uh, he was very upbeat. So maybe, maybe he just found the guy to pass the story on to. I, I don't know what comfort. I, I, I don't, you know, Richard's a very difficult guy. I, I don't know what comfort. Uh, our friendship had for him, um, but I hope it gave him some. What did it give to you? Amazing, amazing journey. Uh, apparently my journey isn't over, but it, it's, it's just been uh, an incredible journey. Um, you know, just learning about the world and learning about other people and uh, meeting, meeting, you know, so many great guys. You know, the sad thing is, you know, we've already lost so many guys that were in my documentary some of the greatest like badass Vietnam vets. And, you know, they left uh, maybe a year or two after the documentary went out. And it's, it's been a little tough that way, but um, you know, just that's, that's life, man. You just live it. And, 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 you know, the, the thing I said earlier about not talking too much about his death is just because life is so important. Life is so has to be cherished. Life has to be enjoyed. Life has, you have to laugh. Life has to be inspirational. Shit, there's enough darkness and there's enough negativity and there's enough terrible things in this world. Man, let's look at the incredible things Richard Flaherty accomplished and, and, and what his, you know, what he um, proved to the world that nothing is impossible, you know, except for, you know, if you, you don't believe in it. And he believed in it and uh, he accomplished great things. I don't want to say does does Richard's life does the good outweigh the bad. But does is there more good than questions in Richard's life? I mean, there's there's a lifetime of service. There's a lifetime of service. I mean, you don't go off to war and um, and not not harm other people. So, but that's part of your job. So. Um, depends on how much you, you, you appreciate a human being's service to his country, uh, to his principles. So I, I think it, it's, uh, unless some crazy story comes out at the end of Richard killing people, uh, <laughs> um, that, that his, his, his life is, is, is um, almost all good. Well, I think, you know, despite my appetite and curiosity uh, to know more, I, on the surface, I, I think you said, you know, you, you get the picture of, of an individual who clearly, as you, as you coined earlier, you know, an underdog for in every situation in life um, and, and someone who managed to rise up to challenges and, and overcome them. And from that standpoint, we, you know, that's, that's sort of the inspiration we always talk about here on the show. And I, I think that, that, that part is super important of it, but uh, more than anything, you know, you mentioned that life to service and, and, um, it, does it does it parallel for you as far as being a cop is concerned? You know, in, in that sort of ideology of service, does does that resonate with you? 
I, I think it's important. I, I think it's important to uh, to serve. I, I think it's important to you know the, look as a, as a soldier. You know, there's there's things in the world that people don't want to know about. You know, it's it's easier to go to sleep at night not knowing what evil is really out there and seeing real evil and um, dealing with life in tough situations. But you're not you're not living in the real world. I mean, I think at least me and you know what the real world is, and maybe we have a greater appreciation of life because of it, as opposed to, you know, people who live in their own little bubble. And I'm not insulting them. You know, your bubble is your bubble. Uh, we all live in our bubble in our own sense, but, you know, we have a, just a better vision of what the world is, what life and death is. Um, you know, maybe we're, we're wiser for it. What are you most proud of between the documentary and the book? Um, is it just that you're able to finish it? Or, I mean, is there anything else in particular that stands out when you talk about the project in and of itself? So it's, it's, it has nothing to do, uh, I mean, those things matter to me, but my God, when, when I get somebody, you know, write a review or send me a personal email or send me a message on Facebook or something that his story had deep meaning for them, that, that you know, Thank you for telling his story. Thank you for not allowing it to. I mean, that to me makes me feel really, really good. It makes all the hard work a thousand times worth it. Um, you know, it just, uh, it's, it's incredibly rewarding when you go out without intention of, of, you know, even knowing if you're going to complete it or be successful or whatever the case is, but you, you just, you, you set your mind to a task and, and, um, the, you know, the, the fruits of that labor, when, when you don't put some pre idea in your head that this is going to be something great and people are going to love it. I don't know. You know, like when, I, when that documentary first went out, I, I was sitting in the back of a movie theater. I remember at a film a festival or something, I had no idea if people were going to like it, hate it, think it's garbage. I, I had no idea. There's no real well way to tell unless it, until you do it. So um, to me that, 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 so many people now find inspiration from his story is, is probably the greatest gift. Well, on that note, David, again, it's uh, it's been incredible talking to you, man. I, I, uh, I, I want to know more. You've, you've wet my appetite for this again, the book and the documentary, a giant killer about the life of Richard Day Flaherty, uh, green beret, uh, and shortest person ever served in the military. So make sure you guys check it out, but uh, where else can they, is there any ways we want to send them to get the documentary or the book or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, we can keep, just keep it simple. And I know not everyone's the biggest fan, but Amazon will have everything for them. They'll have the documentary. It'll be free on Prime. You'll have an, a choice of the paperback audio book or uh, the Kindle. And I got real lucky. I got a guy just through a friend of a friend that read the audio book. And people said, oh, why didn't you do it? And I was like, I'm not good at that. And, and I certainly couldn't have done it as well as this guy did. So he really made it. it I, I feel like the audio book's really interesting. I'm interested by it, and I know the story pretty decently. Um, the, you can uh, you can catch the documentary on Google Play or YouTube. I think it's free on a thing called Tubi, T-U-B-I, if you don't mind yep. TV commercials. They'll show it to you for free. The documentary, that just when I released it in 2018, and then when I redid it, I, I renamed it The Giant Killer Finding Flaherty. So if you want to look for the documentary, just try to add The Finding Flaherty. If not, you, know, you Google search them. You'll thank God you'll see pictures of Richard and uh, all over the internet now. And uh, somebody, it wasn't me, somebody made a Wikipedia page for him. So I'm glad they did that. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know who, but you know, I guess you can just do it. Uh, well, yeah, anybody can get on Wikipedia. Um, still waiting for my page. I don't know if it's ever coming. It's coming, man. Brother, you, you're, you're kicking ass on these on these interviews, man. That's a good interview. I'm really, uh, you really... You, you you sat back, you, you picked your shots and, and you, you asked me questions no one's ever asked me. You made me really stop and I'm like, oh man, this guy is, is this guy could, you know, would have been a great detective. Yeah, well, it's not my first rodeo at this interview thing. So I appreciate that, David. But seriously, in all seriousness, thank you for your time and certainly appreciate the story. I'm, I'm so excited uh, and I hope our audience really, you know, dives into a giant killer as well. And so we certainly appreciate you joining us. Best of luck going forward. I am still waiting for the second one to come out. I, I'd like to hold you to that at some point in time because I, I know there's more to this. I know there's more to this. When you get as the long as you're coming with me to Iraq, I'm in. 
Uh, listen, we'll call the State Department. Uh, I'm sure they got our reservation. They, you know what? That was the guys. I, I'm not joking. That was the guys. I couldn't remember. Like, you know, my brain is in a fog. It was the State Department. I, I kept saying Homeland Security. No, no, no. It was, that, that, it was the State Department that Richard Klein was following around the most. That, that oh, just yeah. that to my mind. They're not busy at all these days. Trust me. No, They've no. got a lot of time on their hands. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, David Yusek, thank you so much for being part of the Hazard Round. Thank you so much for having me on. That'll do it for this week's episode. Uh, we certainly appreciate you guys joining us again. If you're watching on the Hazard Ground YouTube channel, we appreciate you subscribing. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so. Also on KillCliff.com and the KillCliff app. We appreciate you guys being part of the Hazard Ground community, and we'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.